Hi, I'm Ben, and this is the house I built out of shipping containers. Now, I've been interested in shipping container architecture for quite some time, but I had a really hard time finding good information about how to get building permits or how much would it cost. Well, we did the research, we documented everything that we did, and now we're so excited to share with you what we learned. So check it out. We sold this house, and today we're going over the cost of construction and the profit margin. So the most common question I get is, how much does it cost to build a shipping container house? It's a tricky question because costs vary region to region. So I've watched some of the other videos on YouTube that break down the cost of shipping container houses. And the value I get from those videos is that they do a good job of itemizing everything. And so when I'm planning my project, I know that I'm not missing something if I refer to their kind of breakdowns. But whenever I've looked at whether it be a shipping container house on Amazon that's sold for a ridiculously low price or some of these other videos that break down custom builds, I never actually get clear information for what it's going to cost me. So I still have to build out that whole itemization myself, but it is helpful having those placeholders. For me, the ultimate question when planning a project isn't the total cost, but rather how much value am I creating? The final sticker price isn't as important as knowing whether or not my investment of time and resources is going to yield a return. So here's how I want to break it down. We're going to start with the overview, how much it cost to build and how much we sold it for. The breakdown, where the money went and how we could reduce cost. And finally, the analysis, what I learned in the process and how I think about value as it relates to shipping container buildings. Let's start with the overview. We had a total project cost of just over 240,000 and we had a sale price about a year and a half later of 385,000. Now I was developing a new house on raw land so I had costs beyond the simple construction of the house itself. I spent $20,000 for 10 acres of land. I had soft costs for design, engineering and permitting since I was creating a design from scratch and had to do unique engineering relative to shipping container requirements. And I spent about $25,000 on all of that. That's a cost that will vary differently state to state. California is probably one of the most regulation intensive states. So those costs are pretty high here. This site also had no existing utility hookups. So I actually had to pay the water and electric companies for a new meter and the connection to the site itself. So I spent about $24,000 on septic since we don't have access to sewage and on these sort of new meters in addition to also flattening out the site so that it would be buildable. So these are costs that certainly wouldn't apply to somebody that's building an ADU or guest house in their backyard where they already have access to electricity and sewage. The material costs for 720 square feet of conditioned space, this includes sort of landscaping and patios and decks and things like that, was about 120,000. And then I spent an additional 50,000 on hired labor. Now this labor doesn't include my own sort of DIY labor. And I estimate that I put in about 400 hours into this project spread out over 30 weeks. Now a lot of that was project management, but I did do a lot of the welding and steel fabrication myself. Now let's break it all down. Here's how I approached it. I separated out materials and labor because I know there's interest in DIYing these types of houses. Also because labor rates vary so greatly region to region. That being said, there were some tasks like electrical, plumbing, and drywall that we subcontracted out and we just got a single invoice from those subcontractors. So we'll indicate in the breakdown where the specialty labor was included. Another thing to consider is that Home Depot was the sponsor for this project. I couldn't have done it without them and I'm super grateful for their support. That being said, they want to push some of their higher end products. So that drove up the cost of materials a little bit because they really want to put their best foot forward and show that they have a great variety of modern kind of medium to high end offerings as well. If I had total autonomy in product selection, I probably would have done more DIYing for the cabinets, vanities and things like that. In my Boston loft, which there's a video on the Homemade Modern channel, I did a complete kitchen renovation and with appliances on all the materials, it only cost me about $3,000. And that includes sort of doing DIY concrete countertops. So when I position these numbers, don't worry, there's always a way to do it a little bit cheaper, but still keep it really nice. All right, let's dive into the numbers. I bought three shipping containers total, two 40 footers, 
and 120 footer that were all high cube containers. In order to meet permitting requirements, these had to be new containers that were certified with one trip condition. These are pre-pandemic prices, and if you've been watching, container prices have skyrocketed since then. The $13,650 I spent on these containers wasn't a substitute for any structural cost that I had. It did, however, replace the cost of roofing and siding. I spent $12,390 on foundations. Now, I built full monolithic concrete slabs with rebar. Now, this may seem like a strange decision given the fact that most people think that containers are self-supporting structures, but I covered this in great detail along with all the different foundation options we considered in episode one. In addition to the material and subcontracted labor shown here, this portion of construction, particularly in setting the rebar, accounted for about 10 to 15% of my total labor cost. Renting this massive crane was actually a little bit cheaper than what I expected. It was only about $875 total to get the crane to place the containers. Now this still is an opportunity to reduce costs. Since I've become more familiar in working with containers, I've seen that you actually can get pretty accurate dropping them off with a tilt-up flatbed truck, and you can push and slide them with a variety of different types of heavy machinery. Let's take a quick break to hear a word from the sponsor for this video, Extra Space Storage. Small and tiny homes are great, but they don't exactly have a lot of room to put things, and that's where Extra Space Storage can help. They have a variety of different storage options from self-storage all the way even to climate controlled. They have locations all around the U.S., and I have always found them professional and easy to work with. That's right, I'm a client. Now you may be thinking, why not just buy an extra shipping container and use that for storage? Well, because you can get a ticket for that, and I actually did. In many locations, you need a permit to place a shipping container on your property. I had a permit, but it didn't stop some nosy neighbors from filing a report. It ended up getting resolved, but it was a huge hassle and wasted a lot of my time. Shipping containers are great for shipping things, and they're not so bad for building houses out of, but definitely don't take it for granted that you can just throw one in your backyard and use it for storage. Our friends over at Extra Space Storage did put together a blog post that's pretty much everything you need to know about shipping container homes. It's a fantastic resource for those that are just getting started doing their research, and they cover a bunch of topics, including the pros and cons of shipping container homes. Extra Space Storage has over 2,000 self-storage properties which comprises approximately 1.4 million units and approximately 156 million square feet of rentable storage. So chances are they're going to have something that works for you. Check out the links to this blog post and to Extra Space Storage in the description box below. And thank you Extra Space for sponsoring this video. Because we're in a seismic zone that experiences occasional earthquakes, we did have to have a pretty substantial detail for anchoring the containers to the concrete slabs. This cost almost $4,000, and I think this is a huge area for improvement. For our next projects, we're looking at ground screws, and if we do do a slab again, we'll probably anchor plate steel right on top of the slab and just weld the container corners to that plate. What we ended up doing for this project, however, was getting some really heavy-duty three quarter inch thick steel angles and plate and then using threaded rod and anchoring epoxy to connect it to the concrete. We also had to use a certified welder as labor for this thing. So this is the only welding on the project that I didn't do because I don't have that certification. Wherever I cut holes in the containers for windows or doors, I had to reinforce those openings with steel. I tried a few different steel profiles and started with basic two inch square tube for the smaller windows. For the big doors, which are one of the better architectural features for the project, I used 3x2 rectangular tube. And then for the swinging doors, I realized that 3 inch by 5 inch steel angles gave a real nice look. On the south facing windows and doors, I added 8 inch by 1 8 inch steel plate to make sort of a little awning that blocks just a little bit of the direct gain from the sun. And I also think just makes the window and door openings look a little cleaner. Now, if you can find a structural engineer that will stamp your drawings without any inside reinforcing to the container, well then, good for you. 
I certainly couldn't, and I talked to quite a few professional engineers. Most of the professional container manufacturers I know would use light gauge steel studs instead of wood, but our crew is much more familiar with rough framing in lumber, so we just picked up a big load of two by fours. The detail the engineer drew up that attached the interior framing to the containers was very time consuming because we had to use self-driving screws and a whole lot of galvanized brackets. The structural engineer also required plywood sheathing on the inside of the framing. We spent just under 13,000 on the windows and doors with the majority of that cost going to these really nice big bifolding doors from Geldwin. They were just over $4,000 each. Now that might seem like a lot, but I think this was definitely worth it. Whenever I look at people that stayed at the Airbnb, they always took photos of both of these doors open and just really enjoyed how it opened it up to the outdoors. That being said, bifolding doors, while they look great because of that epic way that you can kind of open them all the way up, they are a little more finicky and higher maintenance than typical sliders. So for a future Airbnb, I think what I would have gone here is actually make the opening a little bit bigger and then used a four panel double slider. I just think that would hold up a little bit more against the wear and tear of irresponsible guests. All the other doors to the exterior were glass patio doors. I figured if I was gonna cut a hole in the container, I might as well let some light in. For the windows, I used all fixed windows. We're getting plenty of ventilation through all the doors, so I didn't really need to spend the extra on operable windows. I used Anderson 400 series and had a really great experience with them. They were easy to install and they look nice. The frames were pretty minimal and they're reasonably affordable. Windows and doors are such a major cost component of almost any construction project that I highly recommend really spending asymmetrically. Put a lot of money for oversized features in just a couple key areas and then go conservative everywhere else. We spent just under $6,000 on insulation. We spray foamed all the gaps to create a nice tight air seal and then use rigid insulation for the floor, ceilings, and walls. We could have saved money by using fiberglass bat, but because California has a pretty strict energy standard with Title 24, we had to use something a little bit more expensive and a little bit higher performing with this high performance rigid insulation. Spray foam is another great option, but not quite as DIY friendly when you're doing a whole house with it. Having a better plan for doing the rough-ins for plumbing and electrical is another place where we could have saved significant money. A lot of our labor costs went to our plumbers sort of cutting away steel studs so that they could run pipes within the floor space. The electrical wasn't quite so bad because that's just going through the two by four studs, but we were pretty far from an electrical pole, so we did have to spend quite a bit on trenching. The most annoying expense that I had was $6,500 for fire sprinklers that we're never going to use. We're surrounded by rock, but California has a lot of regulation and you got to do it to get the project done. And conversely, the best money I spent was on hiring a crew to do the gypsum board. These pros were so fast at it and did a fantastic job that I couldn't have come close to, at least not in the amount of time that they did it in. The kitchen represents one of the biggest opportunities to reduce cost on this design. I really like the Thomasville cabinets. They're top of the line for Home Depot. Quartz countertop from Silestone are fantastic and will really last a super long time. Everything looks clean and works well. We use premium appliances, but I just think you can get a little more value if you do more DIY and less kind of fully built out high-end cabinets. I'll put a link to the fully DIY kitchen that I did with concrete countertops for my Boston loft in the description below. The range is really nice and I definitely would use this particular range in future house builds, but I don't think an oven is really needed in this vacation house. Most of the cooking that people do here is done on the grill outside and baking in the desert really just isn't too much of a thing. The under counter refrigerator is a really nice feature that looks great, but it's a pretty hefty price point considering how much a sort of typical mini fridge is. Now, typical mini fridges are pretty ugly, but a DIY option would be doing some sort of sliding barn door type panel to conceal it. We used a relatively low cost wide plank engineered oak hardwood flooring, but then definitely went more near the premium end of the spectrum 
with the tile. This hexagon marble tile is about $12 a square foot, but we just used it for the floors and there's not that many square feet of it. So if that's the case, I recommend getting exactly what you want. And we really want to do this detail where we blended the hexagon pattern into the wood flooring. For the bathroom walls, we went with a much cheaper hexagonal tile that was plain white. We went toward the higher end of Home Depot's spectrum for faucets and plumbing fixtures. In general, this is an area where I don't cut costs too much. Having a leak can erase all the savings that you got, especially if you get mold damage. The smaller bathroom vanity was the more expensive one, and this is something where miniaturization can cost you a little bit more. It's a really unusual size and that tends to drive up the price point, but we needed something slim and close to the wall so that we could have clear egress through this pass-through bathroom. The mirrored cabinet up above though is pretty cool with its little slide out storage features. We used a lot of Moen products for this build and I'm really satisfied with the results. The one area that I would do differently is they wanted us to feature a smart shower system and it worked and it was kind of cool, but just in general, I feel like if the analog thing is a little bit more reliable and easier to fix if something goes wrong, and if the digital kind of smart version isn't providing too much value, even though it's a nice product, I still prefer the tried and true more traditional method. For the HVAC system, we use mini split heat pumps that can both heat and cool. They're a Mitsubishi brand, but we purchased them and had them installed by home services from the Home Depot. The weather's pretty extreme out here in Joshua Tree, so I didn't want to mess around DIYing this component. Although my buddy Mike from Modern Builds is a little more brave than me, and he did a DIY video using a different and a more affordable system. Another area where we spent a lot of money but got a good return on the investment was with the patio pavers and cedar decking. There's only 720 square feet of interior condition space, but by spreading out the containers and creating these little patios and outdoor rooms in between them, we created a compound that feels and lives a lot bigger. We then emphasized that as an intentional move by going premium with the hardscape surfaces. Solid 6x6 six six cedar decking may seem wasteful, but because we used this detail, I was able to do this by myself and save money on labor, even though, admittedly, the material costs were pretty high. I thought about renting a sprayer and doing the paint myself, but it's so hot and dry out here, I was worried about it clogging and just not getting a good job done. So this is another task that I subcontracted. I did do a lot of the prep work myself to reduce the amount of hours that the painter had to spend, and that included priming all of the steel components. Let's talk about labor costs. Because I was interjecting myself into the mix of this project, I needed to have workers that were pretty flexible, but I didn't have a consistent need for every week during the construction process. Also, I am not a licensed GC, so I hired a licensed GC who had insurance as a consultant. He got paid hourly for meeting with me and helping out, and he got a 10% profit and overhead margin on the subcontractors that I hired per his recommendation, but did a lot of the project management myself. This type of agreement is not typical and it took a lot of trust on his part since he's responsible and liable for parts of the project but isn't in full control. No budget breakdown is perfect. There's tools and materials and things like that that we already had. There's things that we over purchased but I feel comfortable presenting these numbers with the understanding of a 10% margin for error. So let's get into the analysis of this project. Another question that I get often is why don't we just keep this as an Airbnb? Joshua Tree is a really hot market for that type of short vacation rentals, and we did. We put it on the market as an Airbnb. We were generating about $6,000 a month of gross revenue, and it was great. We had it on the market for, I think, about eight months to a year, and I think we were over 70% occupancy for the duration of that time. The thing I really didn't like about owning an Airbnb was, one, I don't want to go out and change over the rooms and do all the sort of housekeeping stuff when I'm busy with my design projects. And we hired out a management firm that was great. They handled all of that, but they took 25% of the revenue and they took all of the cleaning fee. And so they're kind of incentivized to have a higher cleaning fee and a lower sort of per night rate. And 
The other thing I really didn't really wasn't super excited about was the wear and tear from Airbnb guests was pretty brutal. So it ended up, even though it was lucrative, it ended up being this constant thing where about once a month I had to go out and figure out how to fix something. This is one of the liabilities of a container house. If it was a more conventional house, you could just send any handyman out there. But if one of these specialty doors comes off the track or there's something that needs to you know, open a container door to get access to an electrical panel, a typical sort of service person might have a little trepidation in approaching that kind of fix it problem. Another topic that I've been thinking a lot about is whether or not shipping container houses are a good investment. And this is so situational. In general, in a typical housing market, I would say probably not, where the novelty of it isn't going to offset the complications that come with a novel type of construction. In a specialty market like Joshua Tree, where there's not a lot of other shipping container houses, although I think that's, that's changing, and I'd like to think that's in part due to the, the success of this series, there is some opportunity because when people are staying at a place for a short amount of time, novelty becomes a higher decision-making factor. And even though I think containers in general aren't gonna be a cost reduction approach, they aren't necessarily extravagantly more expensive. I would say they're gonna be somewhere around the, within sort of 10 to 15% of typical construction. So even if you spent 10 to 15% more for something that's primarily uh, being rented out for short term and novelty, that's probably a pretty good extra cost to put in to create some product differentiation in a competitive marketplace. So for short term rentals, I do think the novelty really adds some value. But if you're just trying to create market rate housing or permanent residences, I think that has it. Well, it's less in your favor. The biggest downside to container houses, in my opinion, is on the financial side. And it's not the cost. It's getting a appraisal for something that's not typical. Appraisals are really used to doing things that are more market driven. They're really good at defining value for the average or the typical. Novelty presents sort of a wrench for them as they don't really know how to value that and they need to pull off of previous references and don't have great analytical tools for evaluating something that's completely different. So one, we actually sold this house for way higher than it appraised for. The other part is on the construction financing part. Now we paid for this construction out of pocket, but container houses are a little bit more work to get a construction loan for. And I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges to access to houses is you can have a really good idea for creating something that's affordable and efficient, and you can have all the engineering done and be able to prove in your mind that this is a low risk, high value proposition for new construction. But if banks haven't seen it before and they haven't lent on it before, they see novelty as a liability, as a risk factor. So that could be whether or not it's containers or hay bale construction or rammed earth, the more novel your construction methodology, the more work you're gonna to have to do to find the right lender for a construction loan. Another challenge is how do you sell a shipping container house? How do you sell something in the real estate marketplace that's not typical? Well, luckily near Joshua Tree is a place called Palm Springs and Palm Springs has a really great architectural history. There's a lot of great mid-century modern houses there. So we found a realtor that was based out of Palm Springs named Chris Menrad, and he focuses on selling significant pieces of architecture. So he's really well suited for getting value off of something that's not typical. So if it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't have sold this property. I wouldn't wanna just put this up on Zillow and then hope that we find the right buyer. So he had a really curated list of people that were interested in this kind of specialty dwelling and did a phenomenal job of getting us our asking price. So now I wanna talk a little bit about risk versus opportunities. In general, the more novel the construction type, like container houses, the more risk you have. It's just been done less often, so there's less people that can solve the problems that you may run into. There's less contractors that are familiar with these types of construction systems. That being said, there is an opportunity in the right market because there's less of a supply of these houses, so they stand out, they're differentiated. 
So in the right situation where you have the money to kind of pay out of pocket, you're not reliant on financing and for a bank to understand your creative vision, you can really differentiate. And if you can stay close to typical construction processes, but still provide value and a really sort of a, a fundamentally sound built project that meets code and all those things, there is a financial upside to that novelty. I don't think we would have gotten the same sale price if it wasn't containers. I think it would have been probably about like $60,000 lower. So I do feel like encouraged enough to build another set of container projects in this area. Now for those future container projects to improve the return on my time and monetary investment, I'm probably gonna approach them two different ways. One, I'm really interested in trying a prefabricated solution. We built this sort of bespoke by, by hand, but I started talking to a lot of container manufacturers, in particular one called Steel Blocks, which is close to us it's here in, in the northern part of LA. So with them, we're trying to sort of develop a new prototype design that we'll put on another piece of land that I had, have here in Joshua Tree. The other approach that I think is really interesting is doing a really stripped down DIY single container. And that I want to approach as a future guest house on my next house build. Right now I'm in the process of finalizing permits for a single family house here in Joshua Tree. This is going to be the new Maker Ranch in my main base for me and my team. And we're doing site build. So that will be the next series that you see on this channel. It will be not container houses, but a very modern ranch house. It's not what, quite what I would call affordable housing, but it's very cost effective. It'll probably be a way lower cost per square foot, but we're also building way more square footage than we did with this project. So I think it'll be sort of a, a palette cleanser of building a typical three bedroom, two bathroom ranch style house with a nice little modern twist. It's gonna be a big shop where I can do my DIY projects. And that's on a five acre parcel. So I think when that house is done is when I'll be ready to approach the completely DIY, no major you know, Home Depot type sponsor and really see how cheap can we build a shipping container house. Now, what I'm thinking about for that project is using a larger container. So a 40 foot high cube is typical, but there's also I think some 50 to 56 foot containers available. And I think what I would like to do is just build a one bedroom house all in a single container, all DIY. Uh, I'll probably still subcontract out electrical and plumbing just because, uh, well, those are things I'm not really great at. And I think that one will kind of show what's the lowest amount uh, cost wise that you can achieve one of these things for. Thanks for watching this series. It's outperformed. I think we're well over 20 million views on the series as a whole. This was one of the most fun and challenging uh, <laughs> DIY YouTube adventures that I've had. And uh, thank you so much. I mean, we launched this on a brand new channel and did a little promotion from our existing social media accounts, but really you guys sort of took it over from there. And so thanks to everybody for sharing these. I know there's been some frustration with the, the schedule of how I sort of put out these videos randomly you know, months and months, if not years apart. But I would just offer you this, not as an excuse, I'll try to be better with the next series, and I think we will be, but everything we see on like HGTV or cable television in the home improvement space, the design and the flow of the construction is all compromised. It's not really realistic. Everything's compressed to meet this sort of television and content timeline. We don't want to do it that way. There's plenty of crappy HGTV shows where you can see exactly that. What we want to do is just to treat it like a docu-series. So we document what we do when we do it. It's not perfect. It's slower than I think a lot of people would like, but I'm happy that we at least we have it all out there. Uh, I appreciate all the questions and comments in the description box below or in the comments. Keep those coming. And we do sort of evaluate those when we take on the next project. So before we start production, documenting our new house, we'll go through all the comments and that's a lot of them. And we'll really try to figure out what's the legitimate feedback and figure out a better way for documenting our next project as we go forward. Now, the Modern Home Project is sort of a side project for me. My main channel is Homemade Modern. 
That's where you see more consistent content for DIY projects. Uh, I also have a podcast, the Modern Maker Podcast, where if you want to hear me talk about what I'm working on next, be sure to check that out. And again, thanks everybody. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon.